Hello, this is the voice of Stuart Pierce, and welcome to my series of Deep Dialogues. These are vital conversations I engage in with global soul stewards from all over the planet, providing us with vital understandings about how we can create a new hierarchy of values to help us evolve into a brave new world. I hope you enjoy, and thanks for listening. Namaste to dear Jeff. As to all of you, all you wonderful people, there are hundreds of people in attendance, so I'm not going to go through everybody's name, but just consider yourself to be very warmly welcomed. And as a result, of course, a communion of light is being formed around the wonder of the Crimson Circle, which, if you don't know, is Jeff's extraordinary company. I'm going to identify that more fully in a moment. And in relation to this much-anticipated conversation with Adamus Saint-Germain. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Let me, for those of you who are unfamiliar, let me just give you a few details about this wonderful man that we have sitting before us. Jeffrey Hoppy, otherwise known as Jeff Hoppy, is the founder of the Crimson Circle organization and is the channel for Adamus Saint-Germain. Adamus is an aspect of what many people call Saint Germain, the Vicon Saint Germain, who uses this name to identify the work that he does with the Crimson Circle through Jeff as his channel. The current Adamus messages focus on the human journey from awakening into embodied realization. Now, through a series of destiny events, Jeff started his spiritual path in 1999, channeling a being known as Tobias. And then, 10 years later, in 2009, Tobias incarnated once again to Earth so that Adama Saint-Germain could begin the role of guide for the presence of the Crimson Circle internationally. This spiritual pathway became, a, became viral within a few months, growing internationally as Jeffrey and his wife Linda disseminated their unique information around the world. Jeffrey has fe been featured in numerous podcasts, several films, and full-length documentaries about the realms of spirituality and the growth of human consciousness at this time. He has also authored five books. So this is who this gentleman is sitting in front of us. And at the moment, we're just going to, um, as it were, move into this very unique communion. And then Jeff very kindly has said that he would be willing to move himself aside and allow Adamus to come through. And um, I'm mightily and absolutely in keen anticipation of this because this particular extraordinary ascended master has also been speaking to me for the last 50 years so i'm really 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 pleased to have you here jeff good thank you thank you for having me back uh, really enjoyed the last show we did and, it's, a, it's uh, an absolute pleasure absolute pleasure um just to touch into the crimson circle for a mm -hmm. moment i mean this is an extraordinary capacity that you're fulfilling which is now an international witness and uh, is there anything that you would like to reveal to us about your work at this time with the Crimson Circle before we go into drawing the master through. Yeah, and thank you for asking. Uh, this has all been an incredible journey. I, I never planned it. Uh, I was in the regular business world when things started changing and, and here we are. And I've seen the evolution that Crimson Circle and uh, what people call themselves Shambra. Uh, it's, a, it's a term from back in the time of Yeshua, uh, Jesus. And I've seen such evolution going through the really kind of the major area eras, the first being realizing that we're not crazy and allowing a lot of healing. The next era when Adamus came in, really going for uh, allowing our embodied realization while we're still here on the planet, meaning you're enlightened and you're staying here. Uh, so often with enlightened beings, they left shortly after because it, it's hard to stay here uh, after that enlightenment. And now, I've sensed in the past uh, three or four months, we're going into a whole new level with uh, the work and with the intensity in which Adamus is talking about. He 
-hmm. talks about the physics, which I, I find fascinating, and I'm not a scientific or technical person, but the way he ex explains the physics, for instance, uh, something he said recently was the 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 difference in the speed of speed being in quotes the speed of light between our soul self and our soul projected self on this planet as humans that difference is what creates reality that creates mass and everything else and he talks he talks a lot about physics uh, he, where he's bringing it to the next level and ultimately and the very reason why uh, I'm excited about today's channel uh, and dialogue with you is the the need for awareness about artificial intelligence um, mm -hmm. where it's going and why we're here right now in that era uh, there's mm -hmm. no mistake at all uh, mm -hmm. if people wonder what their real work here is on the planet i'm sure adamas will share that today mm -hmm. so the, the, the crimson circle your choice of the crimson circle or adamas's choice tobias uh, Tobias came up with a name uh, years ago, and uh, my favorite color is blue, so I mean, it didn't make sense at all. I mean, it's an indigo circle or something, but uh, he said crimson circle. He said there's an angelic order called the Crimson Council uh, that works in the other realms, and we are the, the earthly counterpart, the crimson circle. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting word, isn't it? Because immediately mm -hmm. we think of the crimson nature of blood. Yeah. Oh, and, you know, I, I, thinking, I love the. I was, thinking, I was thinking wine story, but uh, that's. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't drink. <laughs> I don't drink alcohol, so <laughs> I sort of move from that, um, because we often think of wine as burgundy or whatever, yeah. rosé, I suppose, which is almost crimson. Um, and Tobias, I love this fun story of the fact that Tobias was with was with you for ten years, and then suddenly decided to reincarnate in human form. Yeah, that must have been partly challenging for you it was very strange um very strange uh, and and there was a sadness about tobias leaving he taught me so much and uh, i won't go into the long story now but the story about tobias uh he was in the uh, apocryphal books of the bible the the book of tobit and uh long story but i i read the story at one point and then it just all came to me so he was my father tobias senior in that lifetime uh, at one point early on in channeling, he's, I asked him who he was and he said, I'm your father. And it was very confusing and I didn't get it. But when I read that biblical story, it made total sense. Um, but when he said he was leaving, there was kind of a sadness, but I thought, okay, my channeling career is done, which is fine. I'd been in the business world for a lot of years and, you know, kind of retired from that. And, uh, next thing I know, Adamus is popping in. So, that was a whole, no, a whole different can of worms. And presumably there was co-creative intercommunication between the two spirits. Yes. Between the, Tobias and also between the, with the master. Yes. And it's yeah. kind of a, go, go ahead. Um, I just, for those people who maybe are unfamiliar of St. Germain or Saint Germain, mm -hmm. as we know him, could you perhaps just provide us with uh, uh, um, a context from a biographical point of view of this extraordinary, uh, polymath, autodidact <laughs> of the 18th century. Yeah, uh, he his last lifetime on the planet, kinda was in uh, the 1700s. Uh, born and raised in uh, Spain, uh, and then left home at a, was sent from home at an early age for training with the Rakatsi family in Romania. Uh, he left those schools, those mystery schools, uh, at about age 20. Began traveling Europe and became very, very, very well known, extremely wealthy, although he said he's never worked a day in his life in that lifetime, mm -hmm. and uh, was known to be able to play many different instru musical instruments, uh, a lot of different languages. Uh, he was an artist, uh, a physicist, and an and, and alchemist. Um, he was quite a character and very controversial, and one of his main missions was to bring Europe together. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the original European Union uh, mm -hmm. didn't work back then, but eventually did. And uh, to also bring an end to the uh, to the feudal system, to mm -hmm. uh, to the peasantry. Uh, and he said one of his greatest frustrations was as hard as he was working for the freedom uh, of people and to end uh, basically that uh, serfdom. Um, 
he realized that a lot, a lot of people didn't want that. It was very comfortable to be the peasant. Uh, you were taken care of. You, you worked hard and didn't have a great life, but you didn't have to take responsibility. And he said it, it was one of the most astounding things about human nature is that a lot of people don't want freedom. They want a little bit more circus and bread, but they don't want more freedom. It's it's a conundrum, isn't it? Because remember, it's a dichotomy, meaning that we seek connection and belonging. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as we know, in the 18th century, there was this great viral revolution taking mm -hmm. place with, within people's consciousness yeah. of seeking, and particularly because of the perfidy that was being mm -hmm. created by so many of the European monarchs. And mm -hmm. of course, we particularly about the French Revolution, yeah. that he was one of the great influences of, although there is possibility that he decided to transit, meaning move back into spirit, just before mm. the revolution took place. Before, but of course, yeah. we know that he was one of the great thought keepers of mm. the beginning of the Constitution in yeah. the area that we now call the United States. So mm. Thank you for giving us context for that. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're dealing with one of the great influences of the Age of Enlightenment, which, of course, began really at the beginning of the 17th century. But there was St. Germain really taking over and influencing some of the great minds in the world at that time, the world that was populated. So, mm -hmm. um, Also instrumental in, in uh, starting the Freemasonry, the Masons, uh, very yeah. instrumental in that. Yeah. And yeah. and also uh, the Illuminati, which is not a was not a bad group. It was a group of scientists back yes. then. Yes. But uh, yeah, and he's quite the character. Uh, he takes on the name Adamus uh, Saint Germain when he's working with the Crimson Circle to kind of differentiate it from the work he's done with other channelers like Guy Ballard. Uh, he takes on a little bit different persona. Uh, there's there's a definite difference when I'm channeling Adamus versus Saint Germain. And today we're going to get Adamus. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a refraction of light, isn't it? This extraordinary from the higher dimensions of consciousness yes. through the, um, the group of ascended masters and mistresses that he is part of. Yeah. I'm sure they all get together as a collective and have well, some they, really interesting conversations. They do. So may, without more ado, is it possible for me to take everybody through an alignment process? Yes, so yes, please. You can, you can still yourself and bring him through? Yes, I'll, yeah. in, I'll use that time to integrate with uh, Adamus whenever you're ready. Just let me know. Okay. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we come together as a communion of light uh, to welcome with truth in our hearts and, of course, glee in our souls and love through uh, the entirety of our beings uh, to open ourselves as a communion of light, as a network of grace to the possibility of what is now going to be shared with us mm -hmm. through Jeff as a channel. So, please, can you just feel your spine fully aligned? And as you feel your spine aligning, so if you were lying down, if you wouldn't mind just bringing yourself into an erect state, so to speak, and imagine that the whole of your spine is illuminated by a silver white light. If you need grounding, just see the silver white light going down through the base chakra, through your body into the very center of the earth. And then see the upper part of this silver white pranic cord reaching up into the universe. And then just let all your breath go. Feel the need to breathe. And when you're ready, breathing wide and deep, breathe in and see it as silver white light, nourishing and healing and edifying the whole of your being. And then let the breath go. And when you need to, once again, just breathing in. Feel the whole of your being filled with that energy, that pranic energy, and then let the breath go. And once more, just third time lucky, breathe in. Feel the whole of your energy field open into your etheric sheath, into your auric sheath, and then let the breath go. And recover. And rest. And if you can, please, just still yourself. Thank you, Master. I am that I am. Adamus of Saint Germain. And, and 
Is it a delight to be on your show? Uh, Calder is getting uh, situated into my energy. It'll take just a moment here. But uh, in the meantime, I, I want to thank you, Your Grace, for having me uh, on your show. A uh, lot to talk about, but uh, I would encourage everybody to feel for a moment, uh, based on your opening meditation, to feel for a moment how we're all connecting right now in this moment. And not just through your technology, but we're connecting in the original technology, that of energy, where you don't need wires and cords and cables. It's always been there, this, this intercommunication between all of us. And so often you expect, your viewers expect that you have to be able to see something or hear something with your ears. You don't. Uh, this is the original communication. Uh, and, and now technology is finding a way to try to emulate it, to put it together so you can see or hear. But I ask all of you to feel into our connectedness right now. And even if you're watching this a week, a year after uh, the original live session, the energies are still there as if you're in this very moment. That's the way energies work. There's no past or future. It's all about the presence. So uh, with that, thank you for allowing me to make my opening comments. Let's begin. It's a great gift because, you know, my interpretation of what you're sharing with us is what we're all beginning to slowly remember, mm. which is the extraordinary inclusivity of soul force in connection with the source. And that if we can actually feel ourselves to be unique within the I am presence, within our spiritual sovereignty, the divine matrix opens within our being, within our mm. cellular being, and therefore we connect with the higher realms of, of intelligence. Indeed. Master, you have been involved mm. in some very interesting meetings in the higher dimensions recently with your brothers and sisters, the ascended masters and mistresses. May I ask, this is very, <laughs> this is very bold of me, but may I ask what the leading aspect on the agenda was? Mm. Uh, we talk about many things, and uh, I'll digress for just a moment. Uh, we do have what's called the Ascended Masters Club. And it's it's partly for the sake of stories uh, that I use this term, but there literally is. And those Ascended Masters, there is a little over 12,000 Ascended Masters right now. Uh, we gather there on occasion. We've all been in human form because in order to have your true uh, ascension, uh, it, it's you need to go by way of earth. Uh, there's no other place right now that you can do that. We gather, we tell stories about our lifetimes. We feel into those who are in our care, in my case, the Crimson Circle and Chambra, uh, feeling into what they're going through. And it's very, very, very challenging times. Uh, we talk about uh, We talk about how humans still have this tendency for suffering on the planet is so ingrained in consciousness. And uh, we, we talk about how that can be overcome. We talk about how those going into realization or, or really from, from awakening into realization are still choosing a very difficult path where they feel they have to earn the right to enlightenment. You, you don't. And one of our main teachings right now is to, uh, to receive, to simply receive. Um, Crimson Circle uses the slogan, uh, relax into realization. There's nothing you can work for. You actually can't. You'll exhaust yourself, uh, and then you'll fall to the ground in pieces. And in that moment when you release and you, you have nothing left, you're, you're turning it all over, uh, that's when you realize you never had to work for it in the first place. It's about allowing it and then letting yourself experience it. Mm -hmm. But we also talk uh, about... We look at the main trends on the planet. Uh, we look at where consciousness is going right now. It's kind of like watching a ship going out to, to sea from the port, uh, what direction it's headed. You can say, well, it's definitely headed to England or it's headed to Spain. We watch the direction of consciousness. Now, <laughs> it, it changes and it can change. There is not this thing called destiny, but there's things that are pretty apparent. And perhaps the most beautiful and frightening at the same time is your technology on the planet the technology is beautiful because it opens the door for communications uh, and as i said just a moment ago 
the communication, the psychic communication, non-physical, has always been there, but it's been shut off. Now, through technology, humans are learning to communicate instantly around the globe, doing exactly what we're doing now and going far, far, far beyond that. So this is all being augmented or propelled, actually, by artificial intelligence. Technology now uh, using uh, what you call AI to move humanity to the whole next level of the human species. If you look at the big picture of what's going on, the human species, as you now know, it has been around for a long time. It has evolved rather slowly. Uh, evolution is a beautiful thing, but it's oftentimes very slow. And on top of that, there was a resistance on the part of humanity to move to the next level of the human species. Technology is actually doing that right now. It's, it's catapulting that. It's not to say that the next species is going to be just technology, just robotics, not that at all. But with the proliferation of AI technology, the capability to do things that were unimaginable just 20 years ago, uh, the imminent coming of general artificial intelligence, imminent, no, no longer speculation, general artificial intelligence, a term that humans use to describe that point where technology, uh, AI, can mimic a human being. Uh, mimic. Now, in some cases right now, the AI is far ahead of the human beings and other things like uh, the ability to be sentient, to feel, uh, is not quite there. But AI has the capability to actually create a sense of sentience that may not be real uh, in terms of the, the human condition, but it will mimic it so perfectly you won't know the difference. Mm. The concern that we have as ascended masters on the planet right now is uh, the how are humans going to use AI? And that's an unanswered question. We do not know. I could go off into the future, but the future is just a series of potentials. Uh, which ones humanity chooses is up to them. I could go off into the future and say, it could be like this, but it could also be like that. It is up to humans at the time. And I'll give my ending here in the beginning, but the reason why you, the listeners, and so many others are on the planet right now is to bring the light, the consciousness, uh, and really the, the values into the planet now uh, to assure that uh, the artificial intelligence goes in the right direction in service to humanity rather than to just a few or rather than to AI itself. Mm -hmm. So that's why so many of you are here. You don't actually need to do anything other than to let your consciousness shine. You don't need to write books. You don't need to do teleclasses. You don't need to uh, give grand lectures, any of that, if you want, beautiful, but you are here to bring consciousness, to keep it embodied. And it's not always an easy task. So uh, thank you. I, Calder is telling me. I'm yeah, yeah, lot, lots and lots and lots of thoughts. And if I may, before we go forward, I'd just like to go back because you mentioned two huge themes within our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And because the majority of the people that are here are awakened initiates to yes. the substance of their own spiritual destiny, I'm sure that they heard suffering and restriction. Mm -hmm. And so why do you feel, you also put it into the context of it, it has taken time for human consciousness mm -hmm. to evolve. And it feels as though there's a, there's a subtle caveat there. Why has it taken so long? Mm -hmm. So maybe it is to do with the substance of suffering and resistance. Yes. Why do you feel that we're preoccupied with suffering? The suffering first became uh, an experience that the, the human, uh, the angel turned human had uh, in the very early days of, of Atlantis. Uh, you could say that in Lemuria there was really no suffering, but there was disorientation uh, coming in from being a, a spirit being into a human being. Then in Atlantis, the human started to experience suffering in the body. Why? Because it's an unnatural state of being to be stuck in biology. So uh, the, the, the energies had it so 
you suffer. There is, there is pains and, and eventually death. Then came the emotional suffering. And the core of emotional, all emotional suffering, is feeling lost, uh, uh, away from yourself, away from your soul. Although it is a beautiful experience to have the separation between human and divine for a mm -hmm. while, there comes mm -hmm. a point where, again, it's an unnatural state. And this created, started creating mental anguish, uh, mm -hmm. which we still see today. Uh, fast forwarding uh, into the, the times of modern religion, they reinforce that, uh, the whole story of Yeshua. Not necessarily a true story, but it's all about suffering. Now, they use the word love from time to time, but if you actually dissect uh, the, the, the scriptures, there's a lot more discussion about suffering and hatred mm -hmm. and anger than there is about love. Mm -hmm. There are very, very few biblical stories about true love uh, usually ends in suffering or drama. Mm -hmm. So it's been ingrained in hu human consciousness. It's woven right in from the moment a child is born until they die it's about suffering, and now the suffering continues in the other realms, the between lifetimes. It doesn't need to be. There is it has no longer serves a purpose. As a matter of fact, it's it, as you stated so accurately, it has inhibited the human evolution mentally and physically. And now we come to the point where no more suffering, uh, but it's got to start with a few who really understand that suffering is not needed to uh, evolve the soul to or, or to have experiences. Mm. So one of my biggest challenges in working with the humans, particularly Crimson Circle, how do we get over suffering? And it's so prevalent everywhere. It's prevalent within Crimson Circle. There are still those who subscribe to it. And I say subscribe because, as I've told uh, my people, uh, and they, they get very upset with me at times. If there's something in your life you don't like, whether it's a relationship issue or abundance or uh, in any type of suffering, because you're still deriving something from it, you're still mm -hmm. getting something from it. Now, they'll all deny it, of course, but the fact is simple. If you're no longer getting something from it, it'll be gone. It won't be in your life. So I ask you to look why are you still going through suffering? What, what are you still getting from it? It's giving you some juice. It's giving you something. It's time for the suffering to end on this planet, period. It's time for the new human species to evolve. Technology is going to develop one version of that new human species through robotics, through implants. And then there are those who are on the planet right now, conscious beings who have actually waited for this time, who have actually put uh delayed their own enlightenment lifetimes ago to be here right now to come into their enlightenment and to stay on the planet to create the new human species coming from a point of consciousness not necessarily of technology hmm. and of course consciousness in this sense i i'm anticipating means choice yes uh, but one of the great choices that we're waking to is that we don't need to be cradled in the neuroses of separation right that is about suffering uh, but then going into the point of resistance it seems that there is a because we live duality mm -hmm. that there are two perspectives one is that we're extremely willful <laughs> yes so we resist <laughs> we we resist through our will but at the same time we become completely inflexible and so this time is awakening. Uh, and I find it very interesting that we keep talking about artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. whereas actually we've been trying to find the centrifugal force of our integrity, our truth, what is true, what is honest, what is integrous. And yet here we are talking about artificial intelligence. So yes. we, if we use it as a shield, not as a shield, as a screen for our consciousness. Yes. We can actually see, well, if that's artificial, then this can be real. Right. And, and the funny, the humorous part of it, the humorous part is that the uh, human intelligence is the original artificial intelligence. Right. The right. soul has an intelligence with an E uh, yeah. that doesn't rely on uh, 80 billion neurons in the brain. It's yeah. one, it's one thing in, in real yeah. soul intelligence. Yeah. 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 So thank you just for those moments of clarification. Hopefully that helps, ladies and gentlemen. And now sweeping forward into the field of AI, mm -hmm. 
Are you familiar with the fact that many of the inventions, particularly the robotics, that are being brought forth at this time as possibilities within our consciousness, or at least without, to help us operate the world that we're dreaming into existence. Mm. Has this also been in existence in other intelligent species throughout the galaxy? That's a very good question, and, and the answer is no. Uh, there are not a lot of other intelligent species out there. Humans like to think there are. Humans almost have a need to have some god race out there. There's really not. Uh, I've often said that the the humans uh, are certainly the the most precious beings in all of creation, because intelligence isn't the important thing for the soul. It's about what experience can I have. And uh, living as humans on Earth, you are filled with experience. And there have been some civilizations uh, or how would I say, dimensional uh, communities that have grown in intelligence very, very fast in, in their own innate intelligence. And then they've truly wiped themselves out because they didn't have the element of true sentience. They focused on intelligence. They focused on basically what you call data. And, and they, they uh, annihilated their, their own civilizations that way. The interesting thing about Earth is that it's the first place that love has ever been experienced. Uh, mm -hmm. Even even what you say, spirit did not know love until humans experienced it. Mm -hmm. Love is perhaps mm -hmm. one of the most valuable attributes of this planet. It's energy uh, in its golden form. But so often uh, the, these other races, the, what you call the ETs, come here to try to find where is this love? Is it in the mm -hmm. side of the mountain? Is it under the ocean? Is it contained in the heart of a human? Uh, and, and they still haven't been able to find it because love is an aspect or love is a um, facet of the soul. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a, it's fascinating. So you have this element of love that other civilizations, other beings don't have. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you look at all of creation, all beings and all forms of expression, there, there is truly no place like this planet. It's the Las Vegas of the cosmos. Uh, it, it is the hot spot. It is I where. Or if it were somewhere like Rome. <laughs> yes, well, there is there, there is that question. There is it's a very very beautiful city. <laughs> yes, uh, so somewhere floating on the blue planet in the cosmos. Indeed. So all the attention is focused here on Earth right now. Uh, and you just let aside this concept that there's all these highly evolved, intelligent races out there. There's really not. Um, we can get into a very long discussion about that. Yeah, let's not go there. Yeah, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but all eyes are on Earth right now. All of the 12,000 Ascended Masters are watching what's happening here. And all of the other you could say civilization, life forms around the cosmos who have an awareness of this planet, and many of them do, uh, are watching because what goes on Earth also goes for the cosmos. The direction that humanity takes affects everything because you could say that just like the, the past is in the present, these other realities are really just you in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, not the human you, but uh, they're they're not uh, they're not other uh, foreign cultures. Uh, they're all a part of what is happening here on the planet right now. Mm -hmm. There are aspects of yourself, in other words. So mm -hmm. uh, it's critical, and we're at a critical moment in the history of the planet because of that consciousness brought in artificial intelligence, particularly right after World War II, the rise of the computer age. And now it's gained so much speed and, and momentum that uh, it's no longer a matter of uh, will AI, will technology be a driving force in the direction of humanity, but how will it be? It's going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. It is happening right now. And if for some that think, well, this is just science fiction, mm -hmm. it's actually turned reality. And it can be a very very positive thing for this planet. It can help overcome hunger and, uh, and the imbalance in uh, abundance and health and education. It is a phenomenal tool, all based essentially on human consciousness. But will, will humanity 
honor it and use it to serve them or would they use it as yet another tool for stealing energy? And that's mm. the question. Mm. And that's so why... And I feel that there's a, a moment for prayer yes. in all of our consciousness is because there, there, there are hundreds of people who are witnessing this live. And mm. then, of course, we'll be witnessing it via recording. Yes. So in this moment, this juncture, could we all tune into our hearts, ladies and gentlemen, and send forth a prayer of such grace and such compassion that the substance of AI is used for the fundamental development of the human species in a positive fashion to extol and orchestrate the transmission of love, compassion, empathy, and goodness. Thank you so much. I would love to concentrate on the uniqueness of what you're expressing about the unique function of this blue planet mm -hmm. as being, it feels as though you're describing it as a, a cosmic experiment mm -hmm. in the substance of the rarification of the human species, once more coming back into inclusivity, the oneness that you are so aware of mm -hmm. in your ascended status. Could you perhaps illuminate the three degrees that or three descriptions mm -hmm. of why this planet is so significant, why the human species is so significant. This planet is the, the first place where uh, spirit or light was actually embodied into matter. Matter is simply slowed down uh, time and space. Uh, well, first of all, it's time and space and then sl very slowed down. There has never been another reality base like this. There were some that tried some that tried to emanate uh, what you finally done here on Earth, but this was the first place in, in all of physical creation where it's ever been done. Mm -hmm. It makes it a very special place. Uh, that, and it became uh, the, the place uh, for soul beings to go from their angelic form into embodiment, into matter. Basically, j similar to what it would be as an artist, uh, mm -hmm. painting a beautiful painting, and then diving into that painting rather than being removed from it. That's what it was like going into the human experience, knowing potentially that you could get lost, uh, knowing potentially you could get so immersed in your own oil paint that you would forget your way out. But there actually has always been that, that uh, way out. We call it the fruit of the rose. Uh, finally getting to the point where you remember how to get through. But back to your point. A soul is constantly dreaming on many, many different levels. The soul exists on many levels as well, uh, mostly non-physical, but some quasi or almost fully physical. The thing to remember in all this is that you're, you're, there are so many different reality levels. And as a human, you've closed yourself off from those, which is good, because you've allowed yourself to be here on Earth. But as you come into your realization and as you open up to your own oneness, you realize that, first of all, your past and your present are right here. They're all happening. Your dream states are not just wild, crazy thoughts because you ate too much pizza the night before. You're dreaming on many levels, or let's say your soul is. You're also existing in many different reality realms. And the aliens aren't alien. They are you. Uh, there are a finite number of soul beings in all of creation, and they're existing in many different reality levels at one point. So now imagine your past and your future. Imagine your human self here, but also your other facets, which are non-physical or quasi-physical, existing out in the other realms. That's you. That's your soul. These are not other beings, so to speak. They're not alien races. They're you and other forms of expression, all interconnected through the soul. So uh, humans like to think that, uh, that there's these grand civilizations. They like to think that they're going to be rescued by Palladians or something else, but them is you, that they are you. It would be overwhelming for the human in the, the snap of a finger to suddenly uh, realize all their dreams that are occurring out there all their other, what you would call lifetimes or experiences in physical and non-physical realms. It would be o overwhelming and unnecessary. The most important expression of the soul right now, the most important is what you're experiencing as a human being. And what you do as a human affects 
all the rest of the parts of your soul in their other dream and reality expressions. This is all taking place right now at the pinnacle point, this time on Earth, the time that I call the time of the machines, a book I wrote back uh, shortly before the end of my last lifetime, where I went into the future. I went into the year 2020, and I looked and saw, to my amazement, what was happening on the planet with technology. And uh, um, you, you very kindly shared with me earlier that it was the, particularly the use of cellular devices. And at first you thought, why are people looking into looking glasses? Yes. Then you realized that they were actually automatons helping the human species. Yes. Um, bl bless you. Thank you. And is there anything specific about the constitution of planet Earth that is considered to be a great anthem throughout the higher regions of intelligence, I mean, move, moving into the higher dimensions. I mean, for example, oxygen and water mm -hmm. are two extraordinary ingredients that we principally survive through as humanoid. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, you know, when we look at the beauty of the Gaia of the planet, mm -hmm. I wonder if there was anything that you could refer to, to as a beautiful anthem for us to move from the negativity situation of suffering yeah into the glory of what we're living on. Mm. Yeah, uh, it is truly um, your creation, this planet. It's nature. Uh, I've said before that Gaia is leaving. Uh, Gaia is a soul being who came to help uh, infuse life force energy into the planet. She's leaving now. And it's for, the, for humans now to take over their planet. And as you know, it's a little rocky right now. Uh, we're going through a major change, but that, that anthem that you're talking about is really the beauty of nature, that you created the biology, the, the, the human body itself. But mm. when, we've, when we gather at the Ascended Masters Club, we talk about Earth, we share our stories and our humor. Um, one of the things we all admit that we miss so much about the reality, the human reality, is nature. So we recreate it here in these realms, but the original nature occurred on planet Earth. That must be so intriguing for you, dear master, because there you are in non-weight, no space, no time, mm. and yet you're creating a thought form that exists for you all to experience the joy of what it was to be on the planet. That's extraordinary. Um, is there any way that perhaps any of us in our dream state or in our meditation in transcendentalism, could we uh, possibly visit you to see what it's like in your club? I would uh, love to. Uh, we, have, um, we have Swiss guards at the door yeah, that great. only allow ascended okay. masters, uh, but we'll come out onto the terrace once in a while and, and wave. Uh, the... Um, it, the, the Ascended Masters Club, unfortunately, is only for Ascended Masters, but uh, we, uh, the Ascended Masters, who, because we've been on Earth, can come to your bedside at any time, or your automobile seat, but we prefer the bedside. Oh, for what particular reason? Well, we're not familiar with automobiles for the most part. Uh, <laughs> less than 2,000 of the Ascended Masters have ever experienced that. Most of the rest of us, like myself, have never uh, been in a car, but uh, I was very fond of horses. <laughs> and also, presumably, um, coming to the assistance of, of one of we mere mortals in, in lying in bed, it's also during a time sequence when the veils between yes. the matter world and the world of spirit are much thinner, so we can yes. actually feel the extraordinary nature of your instruction or your teachings. Mm. Um, as we look into this time at the beginning of the age of Aquarius, are there any reflections that we may hold into our consciousness or hold within our consciousness of the great time of Lumeria or Mu and Atlantis? No, uh, I, I really don't feel so. Uh, and there's always a tendency, let's go backwards. Let's go back to the times of Lemuria. In a way, they were beautiful. They were very wispy. Uh, it wasn't solid matter like you know now. Uh, but it was also uh, frustrating because as much as you want to, wanted to embody, there was resistance. It was difficult to do. The times of Atlantis, uh, wonderful in many ways, but look what happened there. Uh, it, it, the, so I, I am always encouraging, Schomburg, don't look back. Uh, you don't have to, first of all, it was you back then, so just look at yourself in the present. Uh, 
let's not go back to the time of Yeshua or the time of uh, what they call simpler things on the planet. It simply is not going to happen. It's wishful thinking at this point. We're moving too fast right now. We're not going to go back 2,000 years or 50,000 years. There were things back then that were brilliant. Uh, there used to be crystals that gave off energy in the times of Atlantis. They don't do so anymore. And that energy from the crystals was literally used for things like healing, moving large objects, uh, teletransporting to a certain degree. But we've evolved beyond that. Now it's time for humanity to take a look at uh, that new human species. What is it going to be like? Is it going to be like a, the robo species? Uh, or is it going to be an enlightened species? And that's the true question on the table mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, mm -hmm. I just heard somebody ask, yes, you can have enlightenment and robotics together, mm -hmm. but uh, the enlightenment needs to come first. Mm -hmm. I am so pleased to hear this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Master, perhaps could you give us uh, a phrase to synthesize the meaning of enlightenment? Acceptance just total acceptance of yourself. It's not about accepting the outer world, so to speak, but as you accept yourself and all that you are, you realize then you have great compassion and acceptance for uh, the rest of humanity. So that, that is the most important thing. Uh, you can state it in different ways. It's called allowing. Stop judging yourself. Stop it. Uh, you know, for one thing, it's, it's uh, perpetual. You keep doing it. And you never get anywhere with it. You're a dog chasing its own tail by judging and yourself and feeling guilty. Let it go. There's no, there's no real karma uh, mm -hmm. unless you want there to be. It's also called receiving. In the acceptance and in allowing, you suddenly realize that you can receive. All the energy is yours to begin with. Uh, everything you perceive and you feel and you see is your energy. It's an illusion that it's outside of you, but it's not. Let yourself receive that. That is a true master that allows energy to serve them and is wise enough and grounded enough to know they're never going to abuse it because it's their own energy to begin with. Mm -hmm. It seems like such a simple concept, Stuart. It seems so simple, but yet humans struggle with it because they've had a string of lifetimes, many, many lifetimes, where they're trying to get energy from outside of themselves. Uh, they, they want just little morsels uh, to get through life, just enough. And that just enough mentality, consciousness, mm -hmm. doesn't make it anymore. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're so used to this way. And how do we change that? How do we get people to realize it's your energy? Let it serve you. Be the true master. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, it's changing consciousness itself. And there are some who don't want to change that, uh, who are resisting that kind of change, and not to mention anything like churches. But without that old form of power and control, the suffering, and look, look at every, look at Jesus, the suffering, oh, the Catholic Church, as you walk in the front door, and the first thing you do is see suffering. Mm -hmm. So that, that's perhaps one of the most important attributes right now for you who are shining your light onto the planet, uh, without agenda, just shining a light, the most important attribute is uh, this going beyond suffering. To go into the next human era, uh, what you call the era of AI, if there is a large degree of suffering, consciousness on the planet, AI will go in the wrong direction. If there is enough understanding that suffering is no longer needed, that all energy is yours and it's freely available, and this thing called AI will go in the right direction. And right now, it's, it's unknown. It's up to you, the humans, uh, what to do with that. Mm. Thank you. So at the core of great enlightenment, of being lit up, mm -hmm. is, is pure love. Love in connection with the all that is and shall be. And I know that one of the great teachings that you bring forth is the teaching of the ego emi, of the I am that I am. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could elucidate, just illustrate that for us, could you? Yes, the most basic consciousness is I exist. The most basic awareness that you can have, and as easy as it is to say and dispel, 
most people uh, just are totally oblivious to that. You feel into it a moment. The fact that you exist, whether you're in human form or not, doesn't matter. I exist. I am capable of awareness. That's the most basic thing, followed by I am that I am. There's many different interpretations of that, and it's up to you to choose which one, but feel into that for a moment. I am. I am aware. I am all that I am. I am singular, yet I am many, many facets. I have my life as a human. I have my dream states. I have my what you would call alien life form somewhere else. I am all of that. Beautiful. And as a result, we connect with the wonder and the awe of what it is to be part of creation. Yes. Yes, and, and suddenly you start, as you, as you allow yourself to receive, you start to realize this creation is yours. Yeah. This creation talks to you, whether it's a chair, whether it's a, a book, whether it's a, the sky. And you start receiving from it, and you start really coming back to your basic sentient uh, nature yes. of feeling and sensing, not emotions, not drama, but sensing everything is communicating with you in joy. Yeah. Not mm. trying to tell you what to do or mm. where to go. It's it's communicating the very basic communication message: I exist. Mm. It's the song uh, of the soul. How do we become more sentient, mm. Master? Because many people are writing in the comment box. We have a comment box on this mm. automatic machine that we're using. Yeah. Uh, so we can see. I can see what people's thoughts are, and many people are constantly raking through the substance of suffering, even yeah. though beautifully dispensed with it about yes. half an hour ago yes. uh, but still raking through so one of the ways of becoming more aware of the fact that we are not separate is to move into the sentience of your being of being completely present of the sentience of the i am presence yes how uh, what how then can we distill that power of sentience what do we need to do meditatively physiologically neurologically what do we need to be do so that they stop coming to not suffering. <laughs> yes, and uh, you know it's a it's kind of a slippery slope uh, this sentience uh, for the human because oh sentience, dear, sentience uh, truly means uh, letting yourself feel again. But feeling is not emotion or drama. Now that's the mind's false interpretation of feeling. But true sentience is awareness, and it's being in harmony. Uh, with everything, because everything is yours. The problem is, the reason why it's a slippery slope, and many of you have experienced this, you say, I want to open up. I want to be more sensitive and sentient. And the moment you do, you start feeling a lot of things, including yourself, including uh, perhaps even uh, old pains from past lifetimes, that you start feeling mass consciousness, humans going through their struggle, and at some point, you say, no, uh, stop all this. Uh, uh, turn, shut, shut the water off here because it's too much. When you get to that point, and it's overwhelming, when you start feeling more, I'm not talking just about drama, but feeling energy, it's overwhelming. Keep going. Go through it. Uh, don't resist it. Don't try to alter it to how you think it should be. Let yourself go into it deep. You'll come to a point of uh, fear where you don't know if you can handle it biologically or mentally. You think you're going to crack up. You think your body is going to literally die uh, because it is so uh, different uh, than what you've been used to. But let yourself go into it. And when you emerge on the other side of the, the commotion, you're in a state of pure sentience and it's calm. You've gone through the chaos. It's calm. Your body now is actually adjusting. It's relaxed. It will learn to absorb energies easier. Your mind won't be fighting with itself uh, as it did in, in the chaotic moments beforehand. Uh, in other words, don't run the other way. Don't shut down. Do not be afraid of your own feelings and awareness. It is difficult, and I've seen so many who approach this point of opening up to true feeling, and they become overwhelmed and frightened, and they, they become frozen. 
now they're in the middle of this chaotic storm uh, of emotions and past and things like that, and, and they become frozen, and it's a terrible experience. Uh, or they retreat. They run back to the comfort of their limited awareness. It, you are a being of awareness. It's the I exist. It's your natural state. You're returning to that. And allow yourself just to pass through this kind of chaos corridor as you open up. Yeah. Uh, don't don't do a lot of chiming or uh, chanting and oming and all the rest of that. You're only reinforcing the the limited nature uh, of uh, without. Well, uh, I mean, you know, I am a sound healer, so I think that <laughs> mm. there's a subtle caveat there because we know that chanting and oming lifts us into a higher level of consciousness, away from the suffering. You, you, when you were um, in your last incarnation as mm. human, you experienced a remembering around the field of alchemy. Yes. Perhaps alchemy would be a really useful device for us to also be aware of, because alchemy, mm. as we know, um, it sits within the crucible of the fact that nothing is single, everything is plural. So if we're in negative, we can transform it into ne into positive, mm -hmm. just as uh, the great philosopher's stone was used mm -hmm. to move base metal into gold. Is mm -hmm. there something there, maybe? I mean, forgive me for teasing that out of your vast consciousness, mm -hmm. but um, is there something there that would be useful to us? Yes, there's. There, I want to state that there's alchemy and there's alchemy. Uh, in In my lifetime... There was there were so many who were quasi spiritual, uh, pretend spiritual, and they were just fortune seekers. Uh, they were energy whores, uh, trying to find new tricks to to uh, for wealth. We deliberately distracted them. We we talked about how uh, there was an alchemy lab in Transylvania or somewhere where they were truly taking rocks and turning them into diamonds, and everybody that was that were not true seekers went off on that path. Then we could concentrate on alchemy, the true alchemy. Uh, the true alchemy is simply, if you really distill it and reduce it, it's the ability of your spirit, of your soul, to work with energy, to experience whatever you want to experience. You want to experience turning uh, stone into gold, fine. Most true alchemists don't bother with child's play like that, nor is there a need for it, because as a real alchemist, one who can take consciousness and energy and play in a magnificent theater of the self. You always have the money. It's always there. You don't have to spend time with a rock in your hand and exerting some sort of psychic energy to turn it into gold. You already realize that it is gold. And you don't have to work at it. The energy is just there. The abundance is just there. Uh, so that's true alchemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This has been the most amazing conversation. I want to thank you very deeply for coming forth and speaking to us. And I, I believe that um, this is one of a number of conversations that you are bringing, bringing forth through your, through your emissary, Jeffrey. Um, yes. Is it so? But where, in other words, where, what do we do now, Jeff? Do we <laughs> move away from Adamas? I just want to reveal, because we have about a minute to go. Yes. I want to reveal to everybody where they can find you. Uh, I have to ask Caldra, uh, Jeffrey, um, crimsoncircle.com. It's technology. And, uh, and my wonderful tech manager will put this up on the screen for everybody. And uh, the next big project within the Crimson Circle will be? Uh, exploring true metaphysics. Uh, and they're kind of, it's kind of like alchemy. Uh, the, the understanding that... Uh, that energy can be formed however you choose to. That's the next big one. Plus, constantly uh, sharing our radiance, our light on the planet with no agenda, but in order to illuminate the potentials because AI is perhaps uh, the biggest next step for humanity. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely amazing. Um, and if I may just uh, pause you for a moment mm -hmm. so that, you can shift your energy. Yes. Um, and I'll say goodbye to everybody. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming to this unique conversation between Adama Saint Germain and Mr. Pierce here. Mm. Uh, and don't forget that next week we will have Adam Apollo, who is a very interesting gentleman 
in the uh, game, speaking in the higher regions of universal intelligence. Thank you very much indeed. And Ryan, thank you. See you in a moment, Jeff. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you, Appreciate it.